Hello everyone, and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics Lectures. Previously we have discussed how control block diagrams can be used to model the transient response of systems, and in general we've been looking to obtain an expression for the output of a system, y of s, as a function of its input, x of s, which has generally taken this form for a simple system with a feed-forward element g and a feedback element h. The ratio of y of s and x of s, which is equal to this fraction containing g of s and h of s terms, is known as the transfer function for a control system, and it describes how the system will respond to various input signals without having any knowledge of that input signal. In general, control theory places a lot of importance on understanding the behavior of a system's transfer function rather than its output, y of s. If we, for example, insert an input signal of $20 of excess reactivity in a nuclear reactor, any reactor anywhere is going to become unstable, or at the very least will produce some very highly undesirable behavior. But understanding a system's transfer function can help us understand its general behavior and allows us to ensure that the system will remain stable for any reasonable input signal. We can design systems with all sorts of transfer functions. Some transfer functions might seek to magnify signals, like a stethoscope or a telescope. Other systems might seek to dampen a signal, like shock absorbers in a car. And some transfer functions might seek to cancel some outside input signal entirely, such as noise-canceling headphones. But in all cases, the way that a control system responds to input signals depends on its transfer function. In this course, we will eventually develop the reactor transfer function, which describes the behavior of a nuclear reactor with various feedback components. When we do this, we'll want to understand how to know if a reactor's transfer function is inherently stable, which means that the power of the system will not approach infinity as time approaches infinity. And thus, we'll spend the next few lectures exploring various methods for understanding if a system's transfer function is inherently stable and what possible conditions could make the system unstable. So how can we tell if a transfer function is inherently stable? Well, recall that through the power of partial fractions, we can represent any system's output as the sum of polynomials that are a function of s. And then we can see what kinds of functions these polynomials represent when we convert them back into the time domain. In the previous lecture, we saw for the behavior of a control system that had e to the negative 2t in all of its output signals. This function appeared so often and so consistently because it was a part of the system's transfer function. So one of the first things we notice is that y of t is inherently unstable if any of the terms in our system's transfer functions, partial fraction expansion, contain a positive exponential term. The terms in the partial fraction expansion for our transfer function are dictated based on the roots of the denominator of our transfer function. This denominator is known as the characteristic equation of our transfer function. So because our system will be inherently unstable if it contains any positive exponential terms, this means that our system will be unstable if its characteristic equation contains any positive roots. It's worth remembering that g of s and h of s are generally fractional polynomials as a function of s. And g of s, for example, might contain the numerator, ng, and the denominator, dg, whereas h might be represented by the numerator nh divided by some denominator, dh. Along these lines, we can simplify our transfer function so that it contains no double fraction terms, and we see that our characteristic equation becomes equal to dg times dh plus ng times nh. So what do we know about the zeros of our characteristic equation? Well, we'll start by looking at what happens when our zeros appear in different possible regions of the complex plane. When we discuss our zeros, we'll define a zero as a value of s that makes the expression s minus a sub i equal to zero, where s minus a sub i would be one of the terms that we get when we factor the characteristic equation into its individual factor components. Any zeros in the negative real half plane mean that we have a decaying exponential term, e to the negative a of i times t, which means that our system's power is stable and will reduce to zero over time. Conversely, any zeros that are in the positive real half plane mean that our system's time domain solution will contain an increasing exponential, 
e to the positive at, which means that our system is inherently unstable. Any of our zeros that lie on the real axis and also on the imaginary axis mean that our transfer function's partial fraction decomposition contains a 1 over s term, which becomes a constant function when converted into the time domain. In this case, our system's power is once again stable because it is constant over time. It doesn't approach infinity as time goes on. However, repeated zeros on the imaginary axis mean that our transfer function also contains a 1 over s squared term, which becomes a linear function, t, when converted back into the time domain. Because the system's power will increase linearly without bound over time, it means that any repeated zeros on the imaginary axis will cause our system to become unstable. Now, since we've been plotting our zeros in the complex plane, let's see what happens when our characteristic equation contains roots that have imaginary components. Turns out that this just means that our system will have sinusoidal behavior if it has imaginary components. A zero in the negative real half plane with an imaginary component represents a decreasing sinusoid, which is inherently stable. A zero in the positive real half plane that has an imaginary component represents an increasing sinusoid, which is thus unstable. And a zero on the imaginary axis, not at the origin, represents a constant amplitude sinusoid, which is stable because its amplitude does not grow over time. Just as before, any repeated zeros on the imaginary axis will cause the system to become unstable because they add a power of t in front of our constant amplitude sinusoid. So how can we know if a transfer function's characteristic equation contains any positive roots? Well, there are several options for doing this. First, we could employ some code, such as MATLAB or Python or C++, to directly solve for the roots of the characteristic equation, which is quite easy to do nowadays. While this is by far the easiest approach, we can actually gain some valuable understanding for our system's behavior by using some other, more historical, more complicated methods. One such method is to examine the roth hurwitz criterion of the system's characteristic equation. There are several steps to follow when examining a characteristic equation's Roth criterion. First, we must arrange the characteristic equation's s polynomial terms in order of decreasing powers of s, as shown here, where s to the n is the highest power of s that appears in our characteristic equation, and b of n is the coefficient on the sn term. Similarly, s to the n minus 1 and b n minus 1 are the second highest power of s and its coefficient, all the way down to b0, which is the coefficient for the constant s to the 0th power term. Our second step in applying the Roth criterion is to generate the Roth matrix. The Roth matrix is first formed by placing the bn coefficient in the leftmost column of the top row, and then to the right of it we have the bn minus 2 term, and the bn minus 4 term, etc., until we run out of terms. In the second to top row, in the very, very far left, we have bn minus 1, followed by the bn minus 3 coefficient, bn minus 5 term, etc., also until we run out of terms. In the next row, we have the c1, c2, c3, etc. terms, where c1 is equal to bn minus 1 times bn minus 2 minus bn times bn minus 3, all divided by bn minus 1. So you can see that c1 is formed by making an x in the top two rows right above c1, which is kind of like forming the opposite of a determinant because we have the bn minus 1, bn minus 2 terms multiplied together minus the bn times bn minus 3, two diagonal terms. c2 is equal to bn minus 1 times bn minus 4 minus bn times bn minus 5, all divided by bn minus 1. So you see that obtaining c2 uses a very similar diagonal multiplication approach as we use for c1, but the right half of our diagonal terms are moved over by one column for c2, whereas the left column terms stay put. This right moving pattern continues, and we see that c3 is equal to bn minus 1 times bn minus 6, minus bn times bn minus 7, all divided by bn minus 1. So in all cases, 
all of our C1 terms contain a 1 over Bn minus 1 term, where Bn minus 1 is the leftmost term in the row directly above the C row. The D and E coefficients and all other necessary coefficients in our Roth matrix are determined using the same pattern, except that the entire pattern moves down by one row for D and then by another row for E. So D1 is equal to C1 times Bn minus 3 minus Bn minus 1 times C2, all divided by C1, etc. As we make some of these later rows, it's worth noting that we are allowed to add as many extra zero terms to the right of our terms in our Roth matrix if these terms are necessary to perform our diagonal multiplication math to get our Roth matrix coefficients. We'll evaluate some example Roth matrices later, so don't worry too much if this is really confusing for the moment. After we have generated a system's Roth matrix, we can look at the terms in the left-hand column of the matrix to understand some things about our system's zeros. The Roth criteria of stability are as follows. First, the number of sign changes in our left-hand column is equal to the number of zeros that lie to the right of the imaginary axis. So if we have no sign changes in the left-hand column, then it indicates that our system has no positive real roots and is thus stable. Second, if any of the coefficients in the characteristic equation, such as the bn term, the bn minus 1 term, etc., are either equal to zero or are negative, then it can be shown that our system contains at least one root that lies to the right of the imaginary axis and is thus unstable. Our third rule is that when there is a zero in the left-hand column terms, if the term above the zero and the term below the zero have different signs, then this counts as one sign change. Our fourth rule is that if there is a zero in the left-hand column terms and the terms above and below the zero are the same sign, then this indicates that we have a pair of complex roots located somewhere along the imaginary axis. As we mentioned before, this means that our system's response will have sinusoidal behavior. Our fifth and final rule is that a zero in the last row of the left-hand column indicates a zero at the origin of the complex plane. Now let's work through a couple of examples where we will form Roth matrices and apply the Roth criteria. First, we'll look at a characteristic equation that's given by s to the fourth plus three times s cubed plus s squared plus six times s plus two. We first notice that all of the coefficients in this equation are positive, which satisfies criterion number two. And so next we'll start forming the Roth matrix. Again, whenever we form the Roth matrix, we're allowed to insert as many columns as we want to the right of our coefficients, as long as these columns only contain zeros. This again ensures that we will have enough coefficients to do our diagonal multiplication later on. So now that we have our Bn and Bn minus 1 rows completed, we will now generate the C row coefficients. C1 equals 3 times 1 minus 1 times 6, all divided by 3 which is negative 1. And then C2 equals 3 times 2 minus 1 times 0, all divided by 3, which equals 2. Now we'll compute D1, which equals negative 1 times 6 minus 3 times 2, all divided by negative 1, which equals 12. And then we can compute D2, which we see is just equal to 0. We'll finish our matrix by computing E1, which equals 12 times 2, minus negative 1 times 0, all divided by 12, which equals 2. From here we can examine the left-hand column of the Roth matrix, and we see that there are two sign changes, one from 3 to negative 1, and another from negative 1 to 12, which means that our system has two zeros in the positive real half-plane. This means that our system contains positive exponent terms and is thus unstable. Next, let's generate a Roth matrix for the characteristic equation s cubed plus 3 times s squared plus 4 times s plus 12. We generate the first two rows using the coefficients in the characteristic equation, noting that it contains no zero or negative coefficients, and then we see that c1 is equal to 3 times 4 minus 1 times 12 divided by 3, which equals zero. 
This makes things tricky since computing d1 will require dividing by 0. So what do we do from here? The solution here is to assume that our 0 in c1 is actually some infinitesimally small term, some epsilon, and then to evaluate the Roth matrix as normal. When we do this, we see that our d1 value is equal to epsilon times 12 minus 3 times 0 divided by epsilon. The 3 times 0 term is 0, and so then we have epsilon times 12 divided by epsilon, which is just equal to 12. Although things worked out in this case, it's possible for the coefficients in our Roth matrix to equal positive or negative infinity. So in this case, our left-hand column contains 1, 0, but has no sign changes. Again, the 0 in our left-hand column indicates that we have a pair of zeros located on the imaginary axis. Lastly, let's look at a case where our characteristic equation contains some unknown variable, k, and we'll want to see what values of k make our system stable and what values of k make it unstable. k might, for example, represent our reactor power. We'll see later on that some reactors are stable at certain powers and unstable at other powers. But here, evaluating our Roth matrix while leaving k as a variable allows us to solve for what values of k will make our system inherently stable and inherently unstable. This kind of analysis will be applied later on to reactors. I mentioned before that reactors are most unstable when they're at low powers. This is again because low powers induce less feedback than at higher powers. And in practice later on, we will solve for at what powers our reactor is stable. We begin generating our Roth matrix for this characteristic equation. We first notice that none of our characteristic equations coefficients are zero or negative, and then we compute C1, which equals 10 times 24 minus one times K, all divided by 10. We can add zeros as necessary to compute the other coefficients in the C row, which are all just zero, and then we compute D1. D1 equals C1 times K minus 10 times zero, all divided by C1, which just reduces to K. So now we can examine the left-hand column for the system using the same criterion as before. Our system will have no zeros in the positive real half plane if all the coefficients in this left-hand column are positive or are equal to zero. Based on the possible range of values for k, we see that our left-hand column terms will all remain positive as long as k is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to 240. Thus we have obtained a range of values for k that will ensure that our system remains stable. This concludes our introduction into stability analysis. Our work from today's lecture, which is ensuring that all the roots of the characteristic equation lie in the negative real half plane, is the most straightforward metric for stability. But we will investigate many more metrics for stability in the coming lectures.